creatures of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Alleluia, Alleluia The burning sun with golden beam The silver moon with softer gleam Blessings on our way. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. The flowers and fruits that in Thee grow, let them His glory also show. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him.
morning, everyone, and welcome to our online worship for this morning, which is Sunday the 6th of September and the 13th Sunday after Trinity. My name is the Reverend Charlotte Cheshire, and I am priest in charge of Christ Church Maldgreen and St. James Rothorpe in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire. Today, for the first time, some of us will be worshipping in the building of Christ Church, while others of us will be continuing to worship online. But regardless of where you are as you encounter God in our worship this morning, I hope and pray that you will be able to draw close to the God who loves us, and the God who always seeks to make a way in even the most difficult times. As we prepare for worship this morning, could I encourage you to take a moment of quiet, perhaps to light a candle or some other way that will help you to reflect, to still your heart, to still your mind, and prepare for our worship today. And so we begin our worship with a prayer. O oh God, you summon the day to dawn. You teach the morning to waken the earth. Great is your name. Great is your love. For you the valleys shall sing for joy. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Great is your name. Great is your love. Your love and mercy shall last for ever. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise. Great is your name, great is your love. Almighty God, you search us and know us. May we rely on you in strength and rest on you in weakness, now and in all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we take a moment to come before God and to bring the events of this past week, the things we have said and done, perhaps the things we have neglected to say or do, and the areas of our lives that we would seek God's mercy. Let us pray. In the multicoloured company of your church on earth and in heaven, we celebrate your creation, your life, your death, your resurrection, your interest in us. And so to you we pray. Lord, bring new life where we are worn and tired, new love where we have turned hard-hearted, forgiveness where we feel hurt and where we have wounded, and the joy and freedom of your Holy Spirit where we are the prisoners of ourselves. And so to all and to each where regret is real, God pronounces pardon and grants us the right to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thunder. 
Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if Endo refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. We need to talk. Nothing good ever follows those words. And I bet you felt those words in your body. Maybe your shoulders crept up towards your ears, your breath caught in your throat. Maybe you felt yourself freeze momentarily. And in the pause that followed those words, a dozen different scenarios will have flitted through your mind as to what you might have done to upset or offend me or the bad news that you thought you were about to hear. I can almost guarantee that in those few seconds, you will have experienced a shock of stress. And now, as you're starting to realise that it was only the start of my sermon and a way of getting your attention, I imagine you will be blowing out your breath in a deep sigh. Your shoulders will be relaxing, and you might even be allowed if you're at home hopefully in your head if you're in church, making a few remarks about me and what I just put you through. Sorry about that. But here's the thing. When another person says those words in our vicinity or to us, most of us know that they're not talking about the weather, the cricket, or about to share an amusing anecdote with us. Those words, we need to talk are a precy to them saying, there is something wrong, something is broken between us, and we need to sort it out. 
something you said or did has hurt or upset me, and this is going to be the start of a difficult conversation. Those three words indicate that there is a conflict that's about to be addressed. And that's why, without fail, our bodies react in a very physical way by exhibiting tension and stress. There are very few people in this world who actually enjoy conflict. Well, sure, there are some people who are better at dealing with it than others, but very few who actually enjoy it. While it's certainly not always the case, I'd like to suggest that on the whole, the Christian Church is spectacularly bad at handling conflict. Far too often we try to ignore it and pretend it doesn't happen, instead of constructively talking about it and working towards resolving it. We gossip about it instead. Or we behave in a passive-aggressive manner and globalise it. What do I mean by that? How many times in a church meeting have you heard someone say, well, I think a lot of people will have a problem with that. What they actually mean is, I have a problem with that, but I'm scared to say so because then the spotlight lands on me and it becomes personal. They globalise the issue instead of owning it. Sometimes in churches we take sides without ever knowing the full story of how the conflict came to be. We automatically ally ourselves with the person to whom we feel closest or who is our friend because we see the best in that person, so we can't possibly understand how they could actually be at fault. Sometimes we don't even address a conflict at all but just use silence as a weapon. We ignore the person or people who have upset us, blank them during the peace or during coffee after the service, and become immensely busy and make our excuses should they happen to approach us. Sometimes our silence is so aggressive that we simply leave the church altogether. We either stop attending church, or we decide to join another congregation as a way of starting fresh. Somehow we convince ourselves it's easier that way, and that we don't want to cause problems, or that the person already knows what they've done anyway. But if we're really honest with ourselves, far more often we've taken the easy way out, by avoiding the difficult conversation that would be required to at least try to set things right. At the risk of stating the absolute obvious, conflict is hard. It's painful. It hurts. We feel angry, disillusioned, rejected, and most of the time we just don't know what to do. So we avoid the situation entirely. Part of the reason for this, I think all too often, is that we believe churches should be full of people who are better than others, simply by virtue of their faith. Inside the doors of a church, we expect to find more saints than sinners, and when we realise that isn't the case, we come back to reality with a bump. But conflict shouldn't happen in church, should it? After all, what would Jesus do? Well, technically, on one of the occasions that Christ was in church, he roared with anger, turned over the tables of the money changers, and drove them out of church with a whip. But, you know, I'm sure the passive-aggressive approach is better, really. That's the thing, you see. Conflict is normal. We should expect it and be prepared to deal with it. Because church isn't some kind of rarefied place that's one step away from heaven. Far from it. Church is a place that's filled with people who are just as human as anyone else, have just as many strong opinions, just as many opposing and contrary opinions and views, and can be just as tired, stressed and ratty as human beings anywhere else. 
conflict in church is normal. In fact, it's so normal and so much to be expected that Jesus even provides a detailed blueprint on how we should deal with it. Jesus takes it for granted that we as Christians will disagree with and hurt one another. He doesn't start this passage with, if you disagree with one another. No, he starts this passage with, when you disagree with one another. He knows it's going to happen. That part isn't in question, but how we deal with it, that's what sets the heavenly standard. Or not. And make no mistake, this is important stuff, because Jesus clearly and plainly tells us that how we conduct our relationships here and now has direct consequences for the kingdom of God. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This isn't about how we pray. This is about how we live, how we act, and how we speak. But as difficult as it is to deal with conflict, Jesus gives us that clear and detailed blueprint on how to do it. Step one. If another person sins against you, go to them and point out the fault. No, don't go to your neighbour down the aisle to speak to them about how dreadfully upset you are because of that other person over there. Don't go silent and refuse to look at or engage with the person. Don't go to the vicar and say, this person did this vicar. No. Go directly to the person who has hurt you, upset you, sinned against you, and speak directly to them about the situation. Take your courage in your hands and name that conflict. Take the risk and engage with it. Now, when I read this passage, I confess that I automatically put myself in the position of the person who needs to go to someone else and attempt to reconcile a conflict, to name something that that person has done to me. But what if that situation is reversed? What if I'm the one who's screwed up and someone else has to come to me? Am I able to be humble enough to hear that truth from someone else? Am I willing to be honest and authentic enough not to justify myself and seek to gaslight that other person, but to hear their truth and confront my own mistakes or sins. Second, when a conflict arises between myself and another person, make a point of preserving the dignity of that person who has made a mistake, if they're struggling to own it or to deal with it particularly. Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. In other words, practice honesty and integrity, but do so with discretion, kindness and care. If it's possible, depending on the nature of the issue, protect the privacy and dignity of the person whom you need to approach. Don't expose or humiliate them. Don't drag their name through the mud. Don't use the conflict as an opportunity to score points with others or to split the wider community of the church. Don't post their actions on social media. And if you are the person who is being confronted, resist the urge to lash out or bring up their own sins as a way of deflecting from yours. Listen, hear, and have the courage to remain in that place as the conflict is discussed. But if, despite your best efforts, that is not possible, and the other person cannot hear you or your truth, then take one or two others along with you, so that every word can be confirmed by these witnesses. You see, conflict management is hard, and Jesus knew that. 
Sometimes, however much you might wish it would be otherwise, a one-on-one -on -one conversation simply isn't enough to resolve a dispute. And bringing along one or two others isn't about gossip-mongering, escalating the conflict or ganging up on the person who has wronged you. Rather, it's about preserving the truth as you work towards reconciliation. Making sure the truth is guarded, articulated, and explained clearly in a way that the other person will hopefully be able to hear. But then, when a conflict is so deeply ingrained that it simply hasn't been possible to solve it either one-on-one -on -one or with a small group, then lean into the community of your brothers and sisters in Christ, the Church. This one is probably the hardest for us to accept, because so often these days we have a very individualistic mindset. We see the Church as an autonomous collection of individual volunteers who can come and go as they please. But in its best sense, Church is a community, a body made up of equal parts, that all have to work together to bring out the best in the whole. So when conflicts arise among one or two parts of the body, then it isn't about personal feelings or individual liberty. It's about the health and well-being of the entire body, the entire community. And that's why it's so important for us to work to resolve things. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. In other words, it's in our unity, our interconnectedness, our togetherness, that God promises to be with us. We in the Church are one body, made up of many parts. And just like when your back aches so much that it restricts movement in the rest of your body, when one part of the Christian body is in conflict with another, that ache is felt throughout the community, not just in the one affected part. And finally, perhaps the hardest part, recognise that there are some conflicts that simply cannot be solved. And this is not an excuse to avoid trying, it's simply an acknowledgement that some hurts, some actions, some sins, simply go too deep. To ever be resolved. But when that happens, and we lose a brother or sister from our community, we should feel that. It should affect us to the point that we grieve their absence. We mourn and our hearts are broken because one of our brothers or sisters has refused to relent, refused to resolve a conflict, refuse to return to a full portion in the body. But here a warning. These words of Christ tell us to treat an unrepenting sinner as a Gentile or a tax collector. Those terms in the ancient world were considered to be so vile that a person so named was worthy of utter rejection. So does that mean that we in the Church can shame, reject, or even shun a person in this situation? No, absolutely not. Consider how Christ treated the Gentiles and tax collectors who surrounded him. Remember Zacchaeus, whom Jesus called down from a tree and then announced that he was going to share a meal with him. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, the Roman centurion and his servant, or the Gerasene demoniac, among many others. All of those people fit into the category of either Gentiles or tax collectors. And did Jesus reject these people as the world around them did? No. Nothing could be further from the truth. Instead, Jesus reaches out to these people, tries to love them, 
tries to encourage them to change their ways, and always holds out the possibility of reconciliation towards them. Treating someone as a Gentile or tax collector is not the easy route out of a conflict. Quite the opposite. Yes, we are enjoined to acknowledge and grieve brokenness in relationships or actions. We are required to sometimes make painful decisions to safeguard the whole community. We are in extremis to recognise that one who was once an insider has, by their own choices and actions, made themselves to be an outsider. But if we are to treat them as Jesus treated the Gentile and tax collector, then we continue to extend care. We continue to extend the possibility of repentance and reconciliation, restoration and renewal. We don't simply walk away. So is dealing with conflict in the church a difficult thing to do? You bet it is. Probably one of the most difficult things we will ever face in our communities. But make no mistake that we must face it and be willing to do the hard work and engage with the spiritual principles set down by Jesus in order to make things right. So, brothers and sisters, we need to talk. Amen. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply Longing just to bring something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself is not what you have required You search much deeper within through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all
And so today, as we consider the unity of the Church, let us affirm what we believe. We believe in Creator God, the beginning and source of all life, of light and dark, stars, sky and sea, plants and all creatures. We believe in Redeemer God, Jesus Christ, the light to live by. Born of a woman, he grew in wisdom, storyteller, teacher and healer, a friend of the outcast. He walked the hills of Galilee, sailed the lake with fishermen, lived the way he taught. He was betrayed, rejected and crucified by the powerful, died and was buried. On the third day he rose again and was seen by his friends for a time. His kingdom is present on earth. We believe in Sustainer God, the Holy Spirit of wind and fire, who moves over the waters, awakening love and faith within us. We believe in the mystery that is God. Amen. And so let us pray. In our need and human weakness, let us come to Almighty God with our prayers, remembering first our families as children return to school in such uncertain times. Shepherd God, look after our lambs as they leave the fold and return to school, many after a long absence. Lead them safely through corridors and classrooms that may be familiar but are at once so very changed. Help them to remember strange new rules and unfamiliar ways of doing things. Guide them as they navigate friendships that might feel awkward due to absence and lack of contact. Even though they walk without us through the darkest of times, let them feel no fear. For you, God, are with them, and you shall comfort them. Prepare classrooms for them, filled with patience and joy. Playgrounds anointed with good humour, and lunch tables overflowing with grace. Teach them to be teachable, by giving them grateful hearts, ears that listen well, and lips that ask good questions. Let mercy and goodness follow them in all their adventures and bring them home safely to us at the end of the day. Amen. Unchanging God, change us from the heart until the whole church awakens to your love that reaches out, nurtures and celebrates, neither holding back from what is difficult nor rushing where angels fear to tread. We pray for sensitivity and courage. Lord, take us by the hand and lead us. Almighty God, give us such love for the world that we may pray with longing and desire, your kingdom come. Give our leaders the grace to see their work as service and their role as stewards, and sharpen both the recognition of needs and the commitment to just provision. Lord, take us by the hand and lead us. Merciful God, break all habits of destructive behaviour in our homes and families, our friendships and in all the homes of our parish. Develop our ability to celebrate what is good and face what is not with honesty. Lord, take us by the hand and lead us. Healing God, lay your hands on those who suffer so that they may know the support of your presence and find wholeness and peace in your love. We pray especially for those who are locked into the conviction that they are beyond your forgiveness. May they quickly discover the freedom of your acceptance. Lord, take us by the hand and lead us. Eternal God, in your unchanging love, receive all who have died in faith 
that they may rejoice in you forever. Lord, take us by the hand and lead us. Gracious God, we thank you for providing us with a sure hope in which we can face the worst and not be overwhelmed. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we pray as our Saviour taught us in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, for ever and ever. Amen. And so, as our online worship comes to a close this morning, we ask for God's blessing to be upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us to share in God's story of hope, and so we offer ourselves to its telling. Breathe your life through ours, so that the story may continue on in us and through us until the world is remade. Amen. You are called and loved by God and protected by his Son, Jesus. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. season of the soul If we could see how much you're worth your power, your might your endless love then surely we would never cease to praise Let everything that everything that everything that has breath praise the Lord Let everything Calling all the nations to your praise If they could see how much